you see broken glass in the building? You mean in the office park? Did you see any doors or windows broken? Yes, I saw the front door. Was that a glass door? Right. And that had been broken out, is that correct? Right. Actually, the bottom part was broken. Would you indicate again for me which door that was on the diagram? It would be the door to the lobby right here. Why don't you put a D indicating that on the diagram where the door was? Now, Mr. Bland, the room that you have marked front office, were there any lights on in that room? No. Is that the door where you indicate that you observed the defendant originally behind? Yes. And you were standing out in the hallway? Yes. What sort of lighting is there in the hallway? Two hallway lights, a 100 watt bulb, I guess. Where was the defendant? It's right now. Which way does the door open? Does it open as you have indicated on there with the line this way against the left side of the front office wall? Right. In other words, I will swing my hand inward toward the left side of the front office wall. Is that the way the door opens? Yes. Did the jurors see that? Where was the defendant standing? Directly behind the doorway? Yes. And you say he came out? Uh-huh. And you had a conversation with him that lasted no more than 60 seconds. I said roughly 60, maybe two minutes at the most. I really can't recall. Did you have a flashlight, Mr. Bland? No, there is one in the plant, though. And there is one in the plant? Yes. And the defendant was, you say, standing right where you marked the small X. Is that correct? Yes. Mr. Bland, are you quite certain that... For some reason or another, you didn't need some money on that occasion and start to commit a burglary and then decide against it? No, sir. I have no further questions. Now, Mr. Bland, when you came out and saw the shadow in the doorway of the front office, is that correct, sir? Yes. Was that door closed or open at that time? <clears throat> it was three quarters of the way closed. And whereabouts was the shadow? Well, right in front of the door. If you want to put it on the diagram, you can. I really can't because it just moved. The shadow moved in front of me. Like if I was walking through a dark room with a light on me, I would see a shadow. It just moved, so I really can't say. And the shadow moved across the open part of the doorway. Right. Showing you page 14 of the transcript and calling your attention to lines 5 and 6. Would you read those, please? Read it out loud? No. In response to the question, where did you go? Did you give this answer? Well, I went down to take care of the water softener and I came back and I called the day foreman. Is that what you testified to at the preliminary hearing? I think so, I can't recall. Now, despite whatever you testified to at the preliminary hearing, what is your best recollection today as to where you went after you talked to the girls? I went to the outside of the plant to the soft water and it was after that that you then called the day foreman and then called the police? Yes. Have you ever had a fight with Mr. Moore? No ma'am. Ever had any unpleasant words with him? Not that I can remember. Did you ever get any kind of a hassle over work or duties or jobs or anything like that at the plant? No ma'am. Did you ever have any social connection with Mr. Moore? No. Ever go drinking with him or double date with him? No. Did you ever go out with him socially? No. So your only response was simply observing him around the plant. Is that not correct? Yes. No further questions, sir. I would like to ask a leave of the court to reopen my cross-examination. This isn't exactly recross. I am concerned with an observation the witness made. Go right ahead. You indicated while the defendant was standing here, you looked through here and saw broken glass down here. No, I did not say that. What was your testimony with regard to what you observed through the door? He told me, well, I could see the glass door. It was solid. Which glass door, the one here or here? There is no glass door there, just kind of a window. Where have you indicated so you could see through here to the front door right i could see through the window the top side of the door Twelve minutes straight this is the betty broderick one 
I think I want
Can you tell us what you were doing when you got the phone call, sitting, looking through a magazine? Do you recall about what time that it was? It was about 8 o'clock there, so it would have been 7 o'clock here. You say 8 o'clock there in Arizona, right? So it would have been 7 o'clock here. There is an hour's time difference, certain times of the year. Okay. Who was the call from that you received? My sister. Your sister, Lee? Uh-huh. Yes. Could you tell us what she said? She said, Mom's here. She shot Dad. She wants to talk to you. And then she gave the phone to Mom. Well, what happened to then? Then I said, my mom got on the phone. I started crying. She said, honey, calm down, calm down. I said, what happened? She said, well, I'm not quite sure, but I don't think that they are dead. Your father was talking and everything's going to be all right. Just come home, calm down. You know that I had to do it. I had no other choice. I couldn't let them win. One of us had to die. You know I had to do this. Did she start off talking to you by saying that, that she had shot either Dan or Linda? She told me, and then I said, what happened? She said, yes. She didn't say that she went over to the house. She said, yes, she shot them. She wasn't sure that they were dead. She just said dead. She didn't mention Linda. Did she tell you what he had said? No, when I told what mom told her, during that conversation with your mother, though, your mom did not tell you what your dad said? No. She indicated something to you about how she couldn't let him win? Yes. Okay. What was your response to what she was telling you at the time? I was crying, shaking, and started getting very upset. She just told me to calm down. How did she sound calm? So when she was talking to you, she was basically calm? Yes, the first time. Okay. And you were upset? Yes. What happened then? I hung up the phone and called my dad's house. I believe that I left a message on the line that had the machine on it. I called his line, but there was no answer. And then I called the police, and then I called the hospital, and then I called my friends, and then I called my sister again, my mom, where my mom was. Okay, can you tell me how the conversation ended between you and your mother? Why did you hang up? She told me to get a plane home. Okay. And then when you hung up, you started calling people in San Diego to try to find out what had happened? Uh-huh. Yes. When you called your dad's house, was there any answer? No. Okay. Then what happened when you called the police? They said, how do you know something is wrong? I said, because my mom told me, and they hung up. Okay. I said, has anyone been shot in Hillcrest on Cyprus? After they said, why do you ask? Who is this? I said, it is Kim Broderick, my mom. I didn't say my mom. I just said, are they okay? They said, we don't know what you're talking about. Where did you get this information? I said, my mom told me. Basically, they were not able to get you any information one way or the other? No. So then you called hospitals? Yes. <clears throat> were you able to get any information from the hospitals? No. Okay. And then you indicated that you called a friend? Yes. Who was that? In Arizona, my friend Matt. Was there a reason that you called him? Because I didn't know what to do. And then he just told me to calm down and call more hospitals, and he didn't know what to do. Then he told me that he will find a flight for me while I call other people. So I take it from the information that you got from your mother in that phone call that you knew that she was being serious about shooting your dad? Yes. She never said that she did that before. Okay. What happened then after you talked to Matt? Then I called Lee's house and I talked to mom again. Then she was upset. What was she upset about? She didn't say. She was just upset. Her voice was shaking. She was crying and she was scared. What did she say? She said, just come home. Just get on a plane and come home. Everything will be all right, honey. Just come home. And then she said that she was going to kill herself, but there weren't any bullets left. I thought that she said there were six. I guess there were only five. And, and then she just... Did she say anything about, you know, why she had to do it, Your Honor? Objection, leading, sustained. What else do you recall about the conversation? She just said that she had to do it. I know why. I guess that I should know why. I'm sorry, I didn't. I think it was just presupposed that I knew why. She didn't say why. And she just told you that I had to do it. I had no choice. It was either him or myself. And I couldn't let him win, and that's it. Did she tell you not to talk to anybody? Yes, okay. What did she say about that? She said, don't call anybody. I don't know what I'm going to do yet, just come home. But it was too late. I already talked to people, but she didn't know that. She told you not to call anybody, but you had already called the police and hospitals. You didn't tell her that? No, 
What happened then? Anything else in that conversation? Then she left Lee's house, I guess, because she wasn't there anymore. I tried to call later, but no, nothing else happened. Were you able to get a flight home to San Diego? I missed about three of them, but finally about eight o'clock at night. You finally got into San Diego later that night. Is that a yes? Yes. Did you have any conversation with your mother later that night? No. When was the next time that you spoke to her? I believe November 9th. Okay. Do you recall what the circumstances were? Her attorney, I don't remember his name, said that he could call her. She could call him back. So he said that she wanted to talk to me. I went down there and he called her. Then she called me back. Then we went into a room and I talked to her. Okay. Where did you go in order to talk to your mother? The attorney's office. Office. Was that at his request? He had basically contacted you and asked you to come down there. He didn't personally contact me. My aunt contacted me. He didn't say, you have to come down here. He just said, your mom wants to talk to you. Will you come down here? So I went. Do you want to come down here? Basically. You were contacted and the request was that your mother wanted to talk to you. Would you please come down to do that? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. When you went down to his office, and then did you have a phone conversation with your mother? Yes. And this was after she was already in jail. Is that correct? Yes. Can you tell me what she said in that conversation? Your Honor, objection irrelevant. Sustained. I would like to be heard at sidebar. All right. Offer of proof. Go ahead. Basically, the conversation again had to do with why she did what she did. She indicated that he was running my life and that she was either going to die or he was and that Kim should know why it was that she did it. I think that any statements that she made about why she did what she did was relevant. Shows intent to kill versus accident or sudden panic because she said or someone said, call the police. So I think it would be admissible. It was a long conversation. There was a lot of other things talked about. If she is just going to say what was said, there is a lot of other things that were said that she can ask her. Ask her if in the conversation about the shooting and asked you about the shooting, why she did the shooting along those lines. Okay, go ahead. In that conversation that you had with her when you were at the attorney's office, did she say anything to you about the shootings? Yes, what did she say? She then told me that dad had said when he was shot, okay, you shot me, I'm dead. But she said that it was dark and she couldn't see. And she made the statement that he had said, okay, you shot me, I'm dead, yes, okay. Did she say anything else about anything that he had said? No. What else did she say about why she had done it? She didn't say why, she just said, you know why and I need your support. And he was making me miserable. I couldn't stand the way to see how he was treating you and I couldn't go on living like this. And then she was talking about the apartment in Arizona. That's about it. When she said that she couldn't stand the way that he was treating you, what was she talking about? That, I don't know. Did it have anything to do with the apartment in Arizona or was it something else? The apartment in Arizona and other things. Did she describe them specifically or just make the statement that she couldn't stand the way that he was treating you? She brought up the apartment in Arizona. What did she say about it? That he wasn't giving me money. I was suffering at school. I don't know what she said exactly about it at that conversation. She just said that she couldn't bear to see the way that he was treating me when he was going on vacations. I had no money to live. Did she say anything about that? Either she was going to have to die or he was, Your Honor? Objection? Leading. Sustained. If I could have just a moment, Your Honor, certainly. Question by plaintiff's attorney. Do you recall Ms. Broderick having an interview with me shortly after you had this conversation with your mother? Uh-huh, yes. And was that conversation fresh in your mind at that time? Yes. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes. What are you showing her? I'm going to show her a transcript of that taped conversation. Okay. I do not have a copy of the transcript. He has a copy of the tape. I don't have a copy of the transcript. I don't know if it is accurate. Why don't you come up and look at it? If you could just read what is marked here, page 8 and 9, read it to yourself. Read it to yourself to see if that refreshes your recollection about what was said in that conversation. Does that refresh your recollection about what else was said in that conversation? Yes.
Can you describe what else that she said? Well, when I talked to, to her, the reason that I went down there was because I wanted her to say sorry. Your Honor, I'll object. I'll ask to approach the bench for a moment. All right. First of all, I know the conversation is long, and the witness is now starting to respond to what she thought, what she wanted in the conversation rather than what was told. I don't have a copy of the transcript. I don't know if it was an accurate copy to refresh a witness's recollection with a document I've never seen before. I don't know if she has read those documents, reviewed her transcripts, because I have a right then to see those before I cross-examine on them. If she reviewed what she is referring to her testimony, what we can do is take a recess and let her listen to the tape of what she said. Do you have the tape here if you want to do that? We can do that, fine. I don't think that I have any obligation to provide the transcript. I provided a tape to counsel. I agree. His contention is, how does he know that the transcript is accurate? I assume that he listened to it and it can read the transcript to see if it is accurate or not. I assume that he can too. Now that is another way of doing it. How long does it take? The tape is very long. If she reviewed it, I'll ask to be able to see and review the transcript of her testimony. I think that she has right now. She has never read the transcript. She read the transcript. I have a right to refresh her memory. I have a right to the transcript. I don't have an objection to him having a copy. We will ask for a recess while I'm reviewing it. I'm not going to cross-examine her without something that she reviewed. Shall we finish direct? Sure. Now then, at the recess, make a copy. Do it this way at the recess. Give him your original to review then. I've got notes on my original. Oh, all right. Make a Xerox for him then. You can make a Xerox and cross your notes out. That will work. Go ahead. Finish direct. You were starting to describe the remainder of that conversation with your mother. Go ahead. Well, when I went there, I got on the phone, and then she said that she needed my support, and she thought that this was what would make us all happy, and that we would be happy, everything was going to be fine, that she would be out in a couple of days, and we would be able to get on with our lives. She thought that you should be happy about what she has done. Yes. That she wanted your support for it. Yes. She... Did she get angry at you during the course of the conversation? Yes. Why was that? Your Honor, objection. Sustained. Did you indicate whether or not you were offering your support? Objection, Your Honor. Sustained. Did your mother do any yelling and screaming at you during that conversation? Yes. She said that I was a traitor. Your Honor, objection as irrelevant. Sustained. Unless you can tie it in to the reasons for the shooting. She had indicated to you that she had done this for you. Is that right? For all of us, yeah. When you didn't provide support to her for that, she called you a traitor? Yes. <coughs> M-A-R-I-N. Okay, ready? 225, four boys. Cross by defense. <coughs> You indicated while the defendant was standing here, you looked through here and saw broken glass down here. No, I did not say that. What was your testimony with regard to what you observed through the door? He told me, well, I could see the glass door. It was solid. Which glass door? The one here or here? There is no glass door there, just kind of a window where you have indicated. So you could see through here to the front door? Right, I could see through the window, the top side of the door. And what did you see? It was fine. The window was fine. No further questions. You could not see then down the bottom part of the handle of that door? No, ma'am. From the area inside the hallway and offices is the wall that separates the offices from a factory, a wall that cuts down a lot of the noise from the machines? Yes. The machines are very noisy? Yes. Did you recognize the defendant's voice? Yes. You had talked to him in the past? Yes. No further questions. No questions. Well, how frequently would you see the defendant when you were working together and he was in one building and you were in the other? Well, we used the same forklift and stuff. You used the same forklift? Right. And so he would come over and pick it up maybe two or three times a day, sometimes in the evenings, and then you would go over there and get it back again? Right. And each of you was the one that ran the forklift. You and the defendant? Well, no. Practically everybody in the plant runs the forklift. I see. Did the people in that plant, or what is referred to the other plant, and the people from the plant where you were all drink coffee together, or 
go out to the catering truck together occasionally, but your primary connection with the defendant in the course of your employment, right. And uh, that was two or three times a day, maybe. Well, sometimes more than that. I see. All right. Very well. Thank you. You may step down. The witness may be excused. No objection. No objection, Your Honor. All right. You are excused. Uh, Your Honor, we have other witnesses ordered at 1045. May we take a 10-minute break? Sure. Be delighted to. Let's stretch a little bit. Come back in about 10 minutes. Call your next witness, Miss Grove. Mrs. Studer, please raise your right hand, please. You do solemnly swear that the testimony you may give in the cause now pending before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God, I do. Be seated, state your name, and spell the last name, please. Kathleen Studer, S-T-U-D-E-R. Mrs. Studer, were you employed at Plasmet Engineering on May 12, 1972? Yes. And what is your function at the plant, office manager? And whereabouts in that plant do you work as far as location? In the front of the building. Now showing you the diagram to the side there, marked people's one, is your office in the office, which would be called front office on the diagram? Yes. Did you have a desk there? Yes. And what hours did you work on May 12? From about 8 to probably 5.36. Now, on that day, did you see the defendant, in this case, Mr. Moore? Yes. About what time was that? It was around 4. And do you know his purpose for being in the plant at that time? To the best of my knowledge, he had come by to see Bob Jove, and in the process, he had stopped by just to say hello to me. And were you working in the front office at this time that he stopped by to say hello? Yes, sir. Yes. And where did Mr. Moore come in the building? Well, you come in the front door, and where you see the two lines there, that is an open window, which is up high, and you talk in there. And I am on the other side at a desk. Now, was the day foreman present during this time? Yes, he walked in during our conversation. So that was the conversation between Mr. Moore and you? Yes, between Dan and I. And your day foreman is Mr. Marin, is that not correct? Right. Did Mr. Marin do anything in your front office while Mr. Moore was there? Well, he handed me a roll of money. Approximately how much money? I have no idea. I never counted it. I didn't have it in my hand, but a few minutes and I put it right in my petty cash. How big a roll was that? About like that. What kind of money, ma'am? Currency or pennies or what? No, currency. Bills. But where did you put that money? Into my petty cash box. What kind of a box is that? Just one of those dime store petty cash boxes. A little metal box. Gray metal. Yes. Was Mr. Moore there at the time that Mr. Marin handed you that money and you put it in the box? Yes, he was. He was standing at the window looking in at me and behind me. George came in with the money and handed it to me. Where do you usually keep your petty cash box? During the day, I keep it in the desk, but I didn't always keep it.